Developed in 1978 in the infamous California State Prison Folsom, the Texas Syndicate with around 3,800 members has one golden rule, and it is simple as it is merciless. Betray us, and you're dead. Juan Pedro Solis Vela and Francisco Panchito Gonzalez were the founding members of the Texas Syndicate, and they were in California's Folsom Prison. Vela, who was once a member of a downtown El Paso street gang called the T-Birds, and Gonzalez, who was originally from the Rio Grande Valley, organized the gang as a form of protection from California's violent Mexican mafia and Nuestra Familia, who were far more established at this time. Among the syndicate's main rules, once you join, you're in for life, and the gang comes before your blood family, God, or anything else. The Texas Syndicate stands out because it is mostly associated and allied with actual Mexican immigrant prisoners, thus allowing them to work more closely with the Mexican cartels, acting as subcontractors to enforce and transport drugs onto U.S. soil, as well as committing multiple, multiple sanctioned murders on behalf of those same Mexican cartels. Other crimes that the syndicate's responsible for, home invasion by ripping off dealers, by smashing down doors, stealing their dope and cash, as well as extortion, prostitution, and every other crime that tends to be associated with these prison-slash-street gangs. Notable is their attire of the Texas Longhorn, which is the orange and gray color that you'll see on many of their sweaters, baseball hats, and t-shirts. The Texas Syndicate has a paramilitary structure headed by a president and vice president elected by the general membership. The Texas Syndicate has rivals that are some of the top echelon in the prison gang rankings. The Aryan Brotherhood, Nuestra Familia, the Mexican Mafia, and Tango Blast are all absolute rivals of the Texas Syndicate. Some of their allies are the Mexican, very well-known Hispanic Mexican cartel, the Gulf Cartel, the Texas Mafia, and the Dirty White Boys. Membership numbers are extremely hard to track. But if there's any doubt about this gang's ability to operate on the streets and behind walls, just remember their one golden rule. It is simple, but like they said, it is merciless. Betray us and you're dead. Good evening, I'm Leslie Rohde. Robert Hadlock is off tonight. Explosions woke a South Austin neighborhood up this morning. When neighbors went to look, they saw an FBI raid. Agents searched the Mexican food restaurant Jovitas and two nearby homes after 18 people were arrested for taking part in a heroin ring. Chris Sadegi is live at Austin Police Headquarters tonight where they just got done releasing some more details about this. Chris? Well, Leslie, this was a one-year-long investigation that came to a head this morning at a spot where they normally serve Mexican and margaritas, but the feds say they were also distributing heroin. The owner of the restaurant is Amado Pardo. FBI and Austin police say he was the ringleader of a heroin ring and a documented member of the Texas Syndicate prison gang. His criminal record has two murder convictions on it, one in 1972, the other in 1985. Now, altogether, 18 people were arrested for helping distribute it, distribute heroin in this organized ring, and one other person is still on the loose. Now, around 5 this morning, neighbors on Milton Street say they heard explosions. That was the FBI and APD SWAT teams blowing down the doors at Pardo's two homes that sit right behind the Jovitas restaurant. All morning, agents could be seen taking out boxes, computers, and other items. They also took shovels into the backyard and began digging in search of narcotics. Nearly a million and a half dollars in assets were seized, including the restaurant, where they believe many of the deals went down. Police explain the manpower, the tactics seen this morning were used because it could have been a dangerous situation, and neighbors say it was a surreal scene. SWAT everywhere, fully armed out, looked like a military takeover. We had information that the house was going to be barricaded, also potential with the weapons. And they also knew in the back of their mind how dangerous Pardo could be. We mentioned his criminal record. He did serve eight years for a murder in 1985. That one was in Harris County. We're live in downtown Austin. Chris Sadegi, KXAN News. All new at noon, a Brownsville native added to the Texas 10 most wanted fugitives list. Authorities are looking for 45-year-old Agapito Salinas. He should be considered armed and dangerous. DPS says Salinas was born in Brownsville and at one point lived along the 600 block of Cheyenne Court. 
Salinas is a known Texas Syndicate gang member and has an extensive criminal background. He's been wanted since April of 2015. If you think you've seen him, call the Crime Stoppers hotline at 1-800-252-TIT. Continues tonight, but these court records reveal that members of the Texas Syndicate prison gang had been planning a home invasion in Harlingen for weeks. But it all ended in a shootout with the security guard. These court records reveal that it all started back on January 31st. That's when Harlingen police first received a tip that a home invasion was going to take place near Valley Vista Mall. Patrol officers combed the area and spotted suspicious vehicles off Adrian Street. But officers also saw Samuel Garcia and Juan Gabriel Falcon in the parking lot of a nearby PetSmart. Investigators wrote that Falcon, a confirmed member of the Texas Syndicate prison gang, and another man only known as Salas, asked for Garcia's help. They were from Brownsville and needed help in locating the Target house on Adrian Street. According to the record, Salas had an insider working in the house, the maid. She was supposed to leave the front door unlocked for the suspects. Weeks passed by and nothing happened until the night of Valentine's Day. That's when the planned home invasion on Adrian Street was thwarted by an armed security guard posted outside. At this time, Garcia is the only person in custody, but the investigation continues. Reporting from the newsroom, Sergio Chapa, Action 4 News. More than a dozen prison gang members arrested and pounds upon pounds of drugs off the streets, all thanks to a major operation that just wrapped up in Austin and Texas border cities. Federal and local law enforcement agencies showed off the drugs seized today. They say the Texas Syndicate gang has been transporting about a half ton of marijuana and 10 to 20 pounds of crystal meth across the border and up Interstate 35 every month. And the gang is using Austin as a hub to distribute the drugs. Last week, the officers secured 13 indictments against gang members, two of those men still at large. Say a news exclusive, a stabbing suspect just arrested a second time for the same 2014 murder. This case fell apart two years ago, and the victim's family hopes this time it will stick. Jacqueline Powell joining us live with information his mother and sister are only sharing with KXAN. Robert, Robert Mermalis's family visits his grave here at this cemetery nearly every day. So they all gathered and met us here today as soon as they found out that David Diaz had been rearrested in the Morales murder. And we're told the two men were acquaintances. Diaz was originally charged with first degree murder after Morales's body was left on the side of the road in Northeast Austin nearly four years ago. But his charges were eventually dropped because prosecutors didn't have enough evidence to make a case. Eventually, Morales Alice's death became a cold case, but his mother and sister say they never gave up hope. And today they got the call saying there's enough new evidence to move forward. The whole time they assured us we know it's him, we know it's him, there's just not enough evidence. Um, you know, we hoped, we prayed. Um, as a family, we're really close. We, we prayed together. We prayed that this day would come. We prayed that there would be enough, enough to put him there. And today we got that. Well, Diaz was charged with murder again, and at the time, originally, uh, two other people were also arrested in connection with the murder. Uh, their charges were also dropped when Diaz's was the first time. So now we are working to find out if they've been charged again as well. We'll let you know. Live in Austin, Jacqueline Powell, KXA News. What's going on, you guys? Welcome back to another episode of Greenlit Gang TV. Appreciate you guys checking out the channel. Uh, thank you guys so much for the love, support, comments, the likes. Everything means a lot. The channel's been growing like crazy. We're coming up on a one year here. We're just going to say the one year is like October 21st. Um, I have to go back and check, but it's close to that. We hit over 2 million views total for the channel a couple weeks ago. Pretty dope. Uh, but anyway, we're going to be talking about the Texas Syndicate. And what brought me to these guys was, <clears throat> excuse me, I did a video on Tango Blast a few weeks ago, and I was getting a lot of comments saying, hey, man, you're wrong. Uh, the ones really running the show down in Texas are the TS, the Texas Syndicate. And, uh, yeah, they they were right. Developed in 1978, and the first thing that pops out to you, the name Texas Syndicate, all that, you would think, okay, they originated in Texas. No, they originated in California, and California is one of their oldest state prisons and most notorious state prisons Folsom State Prison. And this is the old Folsom State Prison, not the new one. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, yeah, they, they develop. And these two guys that are originally from Texas, Juan Pajaro Solis Vela and Francisco Panchito Gonzalez. And actually, I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry. Vela absolutely was. Oh, no, no, they both were. They absolutely both were. And Gonzalez from the Rio Grande Valley. So, yeah, they were absolutely both from Texas, but they're doing time in California. 
you're dealing with major, major established person gangs, Laime. You're dealing with the Western Familia. Um, and this is around a lot of time these gangs are all gaining power, notoriety, organizing. The Aryan Brotherhood's coming along. Um, and obviously, over the next couple of decades, these gangs would just absolutely take off in power and just, yeah, they would just absolutely take over. But Texas Syndicate's one of those I think a lot of people forget about, but no, they are very, very strong. They stand out because they're allied strongly with actual Mexican immigrant prisoners, and you cannot, you cannot downplay the importance of that. The Hispanic population in the United States is huge. They run deep. They are thick. They are tough. And yeah. They run the show. They absolutely run the show in a lot of places. Not every place, but a lot of places, especially down in Texas, California. Um, And they still have a a position in California. You know, you just do like a simple Google search of their territory, and it's southwestern United States, okay? So they're not just in Texas. They're not just – obviously not just in California, but we're going to kind of stick with uh, Texas here. So this is kind of interesting. Development of the Texas Syndicate was initially motivated by self-protection against the historical building tenders in prison. So obviously I read that. Oh, I had to go Google what's a building tender. What a building tender was was how the prison would maintain control over the law. Kind of one of those things that the prison did for, quote, the greater good. So to control the larger inmate population, they would look to older, established, bigger, stronger prisoners to keep other people in line. Okay. Um, and then they re- would reward those older, stronger uh, prisoners that had more power and influence. But the thing is, okay, that, bre- that is a breeding ground for corruption, dysfunction, and violence. Um, it's literally the definition of the prisoners running the asylum, you know, the prisoners running the prison. Um, and then, of course, after building tenders disappeared due to a court order, the syndicate's activities turned to drug trafficking, extortion, prostitution, protection, illegal gambling, and contract killing. Now, the contract killing is a real interesting thing because when you when you look up – again, it's just like a simple search. I'm not going to take too much credit here. This was just a simple search. It says they're rivals. And like we talked about, they have some of the – I, honestly, they have people that you probably wouldn't want as your rivals. You got the Aryan Brotherhood, the NF, the Western Familia, Miami, the Mexican Mafia, and, and Tango Blast, and then their allies, which aren't as many. Uh, but the one that stands out to me is the Gulf Cartel. So they have, and that kind of juggles and kind of goes hand in hand with what we're talking about with their very allied and associated with actual Mexican immigrant prisoners, um, because that was an issue. People that came. People that got locked up in prisons that were straight from Mexico, they were not viewed the same as maybe Hispanic inmates that had grown up in the United States. That that, that is different. There is an absolute difference. There's not just a common brotherhood of, oh, we're both Hispanic. I'm going to look out for you. No, 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 no. They were often taken advantage of, and that is why gangs like the Texas Syndicate evolve. And yeah, so – what, what I'm getting at is their friendship, their closeness with some of these cartels was – the cartels do business with all kinds of prison gang, street gangs, yada, yada. But there was a certain closeness with the Texas Syndicate and things like the Gulf Cartel and some of these other ones. Um, it wasn't just – they were doing a lot for them. Actual, they're acting as actual subcontractors committing hits on the behalf of the cartel. Of course, running drugs, but it just – the way I read this was just it was at a much higher, higher level. And they even said the syndicate members have been known to carry out contracts killing for Los Zetas. Just if – I mean again, we've talked about this. If you're watching a channel like mine, I feel like you've heard of Los Zetas. If you haven't, just Google them. Google uh, – I did a video on one of their leaders in the beginning, uh, Z40. Oh my – it it was probably not the hardest video to make, but when I read what he did to people – it was probably the most brutal video I made as far as what I had to read through and, and this, uh, the real, not just, I don't even know, you can't even call it violence. It's, uh, it's just a whole another level of inhumanness um, that goes on south of the border. And uh, Texas Syndicate's wrapped up in that. They are absolutely wrapped up in that. So the TS, the Texas Syndicate, like I said in the intro, it's got a paramilitary structure. 
headed up as a president or by a president and a vice president, and that's elected by a general membership. Prison units are individually controlled by a local chairman and vice chairman. Beneath them in the gang hierarchy, captains, lieutenants, sergeant of arms, and numerous soldiers. The history of the group and documented acts of violence in other jurisdictions warrants their certification as, quote, a security threat group. And you've got to, again, to be labeled a security threat group, you've got to put in some work. And you've got to put in some work outside your known city, outside of your little, quote, area, um, to be labeled that, to be recognized by that, by, you know, like the Southern Poverty Law Center or, you know, the Bureau of Prisons, the federal and state level, to get up on the level of the Mexican Mafia, uh, the Aryan Brotherhood, the Nuestra Familia. You've got to really, <laughs> you've got to try to get there. It doesn't happen by accident. Okay. So, receipt of inmates on interstate compact and the current membership in groups with Hispanic and Latino supremacy ideology lend to the threat of orga- an ongoing organization of the Texas Syndicate within our facilities. The main activities of the TS are centered on drug trafficking, extortion, protection rackets, so on and so on. They all abide by a constitution requiring members to quote, and this is interesting, okay? Be a Texan, always remain a member, place the Texas Syndicate before anything else, understand that the Texas Syndicate is always in the right. I thought that was kind of like... You know, okay. If we didn't get if we didn't get it off the first couple, you're really going to get it on number four here. Understand that it's always in the right. Wear the Texas Syndicate tattoo. Never let a member down, which I feel is like so open ended. It's like, well, what's that mean? You know, like I mean, I know what it means, but you know, respect other members. Keep all gang information within the group, so you're operating within secrecy. Additionally, gang leadership is determined by democratic elections, and I actually do like that, requiring a unanimous decision. Recruitment is conducted through social ties and involves a background check to screen for informants. Going on here. While the number of effective affiliates within the federal prison system continued to grow, the Texas Syndicate began expanding their operation to the outside world. World At the same time, rules in prison became stricter. So like what we were talking about. So as these gangs developed, so did security in these prisons. Because things were going on a whole other level. That's why you hear about the Wild West in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. Um, it just, you know, it, it's absolutely no joke. Abidance by these laws was enforced with violence. We're talking about their constitution again. So <laughs> they are, you've got to walk a very, very fine line within this group, just like other prison gangs. But, you know, reading through their constitution, that's why when I stopped at that fourth or fifth one, understand that the Texas syndicate is always in the right. It, it, it just, it leaves no room for misunderstanding. There's no way you read that and don't know, okay, I, I know where I'm at. And if I'm going to do this, I got to be all in. Abidance by these laws was enforced with violence, often resulting in beatings or executions of those who crossed the line. Both in cities and behind bars, members of the Texas Syndicate began using hand signs and gang markings to show their allegiance to the group. As the organization continued growing, drug trafficking came to be one of their favorite activities and sources of income. Because remember, they're so tied in to south of the border. This would put the Texas Syndicate in contact with several Mexican-based cartels, most notably the Los Zeta cartels, has been known to count on the, on the members of the Texas Syndicate to plan and carry out murders, armed assaults, and other violent, quote, wet work from the 2000s and into the day. Due to the fact that most recruiting happens in prison, law enforcement agencies always struggle, and this is what I was talking about at the beginning, always struggle with estimate the effective number of people belonging to the gang. In the year 2000, reports indicated the existence of roughly 2,000 members. Then it went up to 4,000, and then it kind of hovered around that area with sources even going as low as 3,800. Most convicts who finish serving their sentence leave the gang life behind with only a fraction continuing as street thugs. But this kind of goes into some of their rules. You don't just leave. You don't just leave. And it's, there's, like, there's a few gangs that are like that. Uh, the Aryan Brotherhood, the Mexican Mafia, you don't just – okay. Thanks for the protection. We had a good time. Made a lot of money. Did a lot of drugs in here. I'm out. No, it doesn't happen. When known members, of, this is one of their rules. When known members of the Texas Syndicate are sent to the D- Texas Department of Criminal Justice, no matter whether this is really interesting, no matter whether they have been convicted of murder or stealing a car, they serve their prison time isolated in harsh one man cells where they can be locked up at least 23 or more hours a day. So I misspoke a little. It's not one of their rules, but it's a rule that. 
again, when, after they developed and became what they became, this is what happened with them. And Texas is already known as being a very strict state. The way that they execute people is like no other. So yeah, if you're a member and you get locked up, you are going to be isolated, one man cell, 23 and one. And, you know, and it even said too, I read down here, some Texas syndicate members no longer get tattoos in order to avoid being identified by prison guards or other law enforcement. So, you know, there's the rule obviously that was developed in the beginning. You got to have the tattoo, uh, but rules, rules sometimes change over time, right? Obviously the ones that you're in for life, respect, all that other stuff, the syndicate's always right, comes for anything else, but Tattoos is kind of one of those things, and I have read and done videos on gangs that don't don't like tattoos. They they don't like uh, being just sticking out like a sore thumb, and uh, yeah, you know. Now, one interesting thing was, and I put a picture up of a guy. They had a time where you didn't have. They had a they had a small window where they were letting non Hispanic uh, inmates and members in. There's a picture I put up of a – he's white. He's a white Texas syndicate member. But then they stopped that. They they cut that off. They said no more. Nope, 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 nope. We got to go back to the old way. Uh, Hispanic only. And again, it's a thick, thorough vetting, recruiting process. Um, yeah, you know, it's just – it's absolutely no way. So when I was going through this again, okay – the syndicate is the oldest of the Texas prison gangs. And again, they, I kept reading through their guesstimating numbers, all right? The majority of those members are males aged between 20 and 40. And, and this is another interesting part. The gang actually maintains its cor- headquarters in <clears throat> excuse me, maintains its headquarters in California. And then again, the rest of them are scattered throughout prisons and jails in Texas with many others operating on the outside. Get this, okay? How we talk about the, them making that security threat level group and getting onto the main stage with the AB, with the Mexican mafia. Um, the Texas, again, also operates in state and federal prisons across the United States with significant activity being reported in FCI Oakdale in Louisiana and San Quentin's prison in California, and this is crazy, as well as some representation in the Florida Department of Corrections as a street gang. Heavy activity has been reported in Austin, Corpus Christi, and the Rio Grande Valley, and the Dallas-Fort Worth area in Texas. So, obviously, four huge, huge hubs within Texas, and, you know, they, but when you read that, when you see Florida, Louisiana, now you're talking not just Southwestern, now you're talking the entire South. Um, and I guarantee you, especially with the, the way the federal the, – the one thing I will say and one common thing I've noticed is with the way the federal prison system works, it they, they ship these guys out, right? So they took these guys, the California Aaron Brotherhood, okay? A perfect example of that. They take Barry Mills <clears> – <throat> excuse me. They, they ship these guys to, to Leavenworth. They ship these guys across the country. Well, that doesn't mean they're going to stop. So they develop this gang – now they're developing this gang on the East Coast, and now they're developing this gang in the Midwest because these prison, prisoners go all over. Okay, that's the thing with the feds, right? You, you don't know where you're going to go. You really don't know where you're going to go. You might know your security level. Okay, you have an idea. But how do you think it's said right there? There's serious membership. There's serious activity in FCI, a federal institution in Louisiana and, and, and Florida. And I really think that the way the federal prison system did things – I will say this after reading and doing as many of these videos as I've done. I really think that that only expanded. It's kind of like the cream rose to the top. Yes, some of these smaller underdeveloped gangs by spreading people out, by cutting off ties, it it broke them down, kind of washed them out. But the ones that are really strong and developed and have strong leadership, they thrived. You know, they absolutely thrive. You could not get rid of them. Um, Again, the Mexican Mafia, the Aryan Brother, the Texas Syndicate, the Nuestra Familia. These guys, you're not just going to – just because you're shipping them across the country, where there's a will, there's a way. And when you're in a cell 20-plus hours a day, and if you have a strong mind like a lot of these guys do, a lot of these leadership and members do, you could put me in Alaska. You could put me in Hawaii. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You could put me in the Bahamas. It doesn't matter. 
They have rights. They have legal rights. A lot of stuff goes out through legal mail uh, because I, I have people that ask me, well, how do they get all this stuff out? It's, it tends to be kind of the same thing. Corruption. You've got staff. Okay. But America has rights for prisoners. And one of those main rights is legal mail, the right to meet with your lawyer. And it doesn't take much to offer. If you've got money, if you've got the ability to kind of maybe scare a lawyer, scare somebody, maybe somebody shows up to his house a week before his visit with you and says, hey, you're going to do this and we're going to give you $5,000 or a bullet. You're going to, you're just going to do it. So anyway, there you guys have it. Another really interesting video that Texas syndicates are very interesting gang. Um, one question I have one question, please leave a comment down below. I think it's true, but I, I hear the term Paisa. I hear the term Paisa, like I'm rolling Paisa, which is a basically just a true Hispanic immigrant. And I think the word Paisa means like brother, uh, kind of what it stands for generally. Would that be what a lot of these Texas syndicate members start out as before they're actually Texas syndicate members? Are they just rolling Paisa and then they get recruited in? So if you know, please leave a comment down below again. Thank you guys so much for all the views. We're coming up on the one-year thing. Until next time, peace.